Getting caught up to where we were uh, last week, we went through chapter 7 last week, and I think the, the biggest lesson in chapter 7 is the fact that the same Spirit that resides in me also resides in all other Spirit-filled Christian believers. Okay, You've got to remember that. That's probably the biggest lesson. And so therefore our in-house disputes are always, if there are between fellow Spirit-led believers, He, the Holy Spirit, will fix it. Right? Just, so what? Opinions, you know, one likes chocolate, one likes strawberry. You know, so what? So we try to rotate or get both. Right? Uh, not a big deal. But, if it's not being fixed, then somebody is not listening to the voice of the Spirit. And, um, and I challenged each of us at the end of last chapter, uh, is that other person you? Or is it somebody else that's not listening to the Holy Spirit? So, um, always remember to ask yourself. So today, going into chapter 8, then um, Paul is going to continue on with the lessons that we have for, for those people and for us, the Californians as well. So, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Okay, so first Macedonia was what they called the northern Greece region in those days. Um, Achaia uh, was the southern Greece region where Corinth was. So yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, like counties or whatever. And we're in this, the Achaia is down there in Corinth. These guys, they're in the southern region, you know, the southern county, and then Macedonians, the guys to up to the north of them. So um, even though they were not very far away, there was enough distance that they had much different economies. Uh, you can see that in northern and southern California, I think, as well. The economy is different uh, between the two. So anyway, and, and as here, there, the southern economy was doing very well. The northern economy wasn't so much. They didn't have much. The people living up there were very poor economically. And um, while in Corinth, in the south, uh, because of its location as a trade hub, it was always a bustling, wealthy economy. So there was always plenty down there. So that's, that's what we had to know of the time. The churches up in Macedonia had experienced and displayed God's grace through their generosity. They were much like the poor widow in Jesus' parable in Luke 21 because they gave from their poverty. Remember Jesus said, I tell you that poor widow that dropped the two mites in the tar gave more than those other guys that were just making all the noise. Because she gave out of her poverty. So this was much the same. We can find it easy to be generous when we have more than we need and we can spare some, right? That's usually the way it goes. I have plenty, I can spare some, right? But giving beyond ability is when you barely have enough to get by on or you don't feel you have enough to get by on, but you give anyway because you feel the Lord is leading you to. So you do, and you trust Him to make it work. To make it work out somehow. And that's really, you know, your giving always comes down to a matter of whether or not you trust the Lord. Do you trust Him to make the difference? And so anyway, um, th that's what was going on here. He's trying to tell these people, hey, your northern neighbors, na neighbors to the north, while the dollar amount may not be nearly as much as you guys gave. They gave from a place that it was a greater percentage or whatever of what they had. It's pretty easy for people to uh, say, ah, well, you know, 
I figure about everybody pays such and such a month, everything ought to be just fine. So that's the amount I'll, I'll pay. And that's the amount I'll give. And so you set that in mind that that'll be fine, but you have plenty more. Didn't hurt you at all. Someone else, in order to give that same amount, they're worried about whether or not they're going to get by, right? So it's it's kind of a matter of uh, percentage-wise, and, and what you'll find in the churches, too, you'll find the people with the poorest are closer to tithing, usually, and the people who are more wealthy, they don't even get close to giving a tithe, <laughs> usually. That's, that's mostly what you see. And so that's kind of the lesson he's given the Corinthian people right now. It's like, you guys have plenty. You guys have it made down there in Corinth. And these guys, the reason they're enjoying such spiritual blessings up there is because their giving attitude toward the Lord to give even out of their need and beyond their ability, he's blessing them in so many other ways. Now, it doesn't come back. I know the health and prosperity teachers would like to try to tell you, you know what, you can, whatever you give, the Lord will give you back a hundred times. And they like to they quote the scriptures, pressed down, shaken together, and a hundredfold and everything like that. But you know what? Through study of the scripture verses and life, I can tell you that it's not that way. And what he was speaking of was not talking about get, being paid back in the same kind. You put $100 in, don't expect to get a windfall of 1000 no matter how many different stories you hear people tell of how they did and it did. You know, We don't put in $100 into the offering and expect to get the Lord's going to bless you with 1000 back because it doesn't work that way. But when you give generously because the Holy Spirit is guiding you and you give to a point where it even costs you a little bit because you gave to Him, then He blesses you in other ways. And He always makes sure that you have enough. Now, I know that from personal experience. When I decided I'm going to take tithing serious and I'm going to actually do that, Ever since then, I've always had enough. There's always been enough. There have been times when there have been excess. And I've had extra, and then I see, oh, it's the reason I have extra is because someone else has a need, and I need to help them. And that's the way it works out. And I have the ability to give and help them in that need. And guess what? I always have enough to get by. And it doesn't matter what the dollar amount is. It's the principle behind it at that. As long as you are being faithful to the, what the Lord is leading you, He takes care of you. And when it comes to a point where they give, you give even out of your need and out of not understanding how it's going to make it, but you give it to Him anyway, He blesses you because you trusted Him enough to go ahead and trust Him and do it. Not knowing how it was going to work, but you trust that He will make it work out. And in that, you're blessed in many other ways. And there usually always is enough for, for all of your needs, and then some. And there's extra blessings in other ways. Now, what Paul is talking about here is that they were blessed in spiritual ways. I, they gave out of their, you know, their, their most severe trial they're going through, but their overflowing joy. Even in their extreme poverty, they were a happy group of people up there. They had joy. Now, when there's a joy unspeakable, it's full of glory. Have you heard that one before? When the joy is unspeakable, you don't understand why. You even have, you, have you ever had that? You ever had joy and you, you, and you look at your circumstances and you say, I don't even know why I'm happy. There's no good reason for me to be happy right now. Things around me are pretty much dead, right? But yet, for some reason, I have some happiness. Now, you, you might say, like, you know, well, usually it's the other way around. I look around and I ought to be happy, and I'm not, and I don't know why. Yeah. Well, there's a correlation between the blessings that we receive and the, reason, the way we're willing to trust the Lord in all things. And... Um, 
Um, and the blessings are not always of the same kind. When we give monetarily, we don't always receive back a great blessing monetarily, but we will receive a blessing back one way or another. And that's the principle that Jesus was teaching about the poor widow and the might and, and the, the other parables about how when you give, it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken, and a hundredfold. It's, it's not talking about the same kind. It's talking about just blessings in general. And Paul is telling the same kind of lesson here to the Corinthian church when he speaks of the Macedonians to their north. So, all right, let's go to the next few verses there. Still talking about them. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. See, notice the, the grace displayed in a spirit of generosity. It caused these people to hear about the poor in Jerusalem and that Paul was collecting gifts from the churches in the West to take back to Jerusalem to help out the extremely poor people there. I mean, the people even in the northern, you know, in Macedonia didn't have it as bad as the Christians in Jerusalem did. Remember, if you're a Christian in Jerusalem, you're out of a job, pretty much. I mean, you're going to have trouble getting by in, in that time because the Jews ran everything, right? And if you decide you're a Christian and they decide that they're not into that and the, the, the temple priests, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they don't give their blessing on that new sect of Christianity, then you've just gone off and, and done something that, that you're persona non grata, right? And you don't get a job, you don't get to hang out in their social clubs and all that kind of stuff and you're the poorest of the poor in a city that was already having it rough anyway. So that's how bad the Christian people in the Christian church in Jerusalem had it. That even the Macedonians who were poor in the, over in the western provinces, they gave and helped them out. The, the church in, in Greece. I mean in, in, in um, Jerusalem. But Paul didn't by any means beg them for the money. They begged him to participate. I can just, I can just see it in my head right now. He mentioned that, you know, I'm going around, I'm going to collect um, gifts to send back to Jerusalem to help the, the poor believers there. And they go, oh, let us in on any, he's probably like, oh, you guys, you don't really have much to go around. You, you know, you guys are barely getting by as it is and keeping afloat. And they're like, no, no, but we want to, we want to give too. Can you just see it? But we want to be a part of it. Maybe we can't give much, but we'll get our pennies in a penny jar together and we'll give you what we can, right? And that's the kind of thing that was happening there. And um, they begged for the opportunity for him to take the money back to Jerusalem. Here, take our little bit too. We don't have a whole lot, but we made a, took up a collection and we got 20 bucks here between all of us. And still send that back with the 20,000 that the people down in Corinth are sending. You know, that was probably close to what it was. Maybe they're sending a $20,000 gift from Corinth, 20 bucks from Macedonia, but at least they participated. And to them, it was it, because of their spirit of generosity that they had, they were being blessed by it, and they had great joy. And the Corinthian church was always in an upheaval. Always something, yeah, problems going on among them, right? Always stuff that had to be corrected. Macedonians didn't seem to have all that strife going on. Anyway, this, this is why Paul was bragging on them here to the Corinthians. He's telling the wealthy Christians in Corinth about the joyous generosity of the poor Christians in Macedonia and hoping to inspire them to give generously as well. Um, if the Corinthians were to give just all of their extra, it would be a huge sum. Uh, it's funny how often I've seen this same phenomenon in the churches today. I've noticed how people with very little sometimes will be the ones who come up with the giving that's totally unexpected. And it, it may only be a few bucks, but they, they don't seem like they have a few bucks to spare, and yet they still will do that. Uh, anyway, um, 
it seems to be a matter of perspective. One perspective sees God in control, the other believes they have to be in control, or believes they are in control. How often do you get that attitude when things are going fine? You have enough money to get by on, you even have a little bit extra. I got this, Lord. Right? Who's in control? I got this. I'm in control. When you don't have enough and you're not, you're barely getting by everything. Who are you going to, Lord? You you need to get this, Lord. You have you got this? <laughs> you know, I I have need. You see, and, and then you get used to knowing He's got this. Where when you have plenty, you forget that and you think you've got it. Right? Difference in perspective. All right, verses six through seven. So we urge Titus. Since he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. It kind of sounds like he's buttering them up a little bit. You guys have, you know, you're doing well. And and by the way, this second letter does seem like he is doing that more. He's giving them some accolades. He's he's like, you guys have improved a lot. You fixed these things. And 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 I'm grateful. I was worried there for a minute, but then when Titus finally made it back, he told me how you guys were worried about us, and how that you were really concerned, and then you wanted to see us again, and you wanted to bless us. And you hoped that we were well, and you were, you were concerned about us. Wow, thank you. We were so appreciative of that, you know. Well, because we were worried you hated us, you know, because it sounded like it before. But now we get the new news. No, you had a change of heart on that. You're doing great. So this second letter, he is giving them some. So this isn't just like total flattery here when he's saying, you know, you you excel in everything, in faith, and speech, and knowledge, and complete earnestness, and in your love for us. And then there's one thing. I, I want you to excel in also your generosity. Paul knows that they probably had enough in their excess in Corinth to take care of the problem in Jerusalem. They could underwrite the whole thing. Do you remember a time when this small church was monthly giving support to a pastor down in Mexico and what we saw as just a monthly little amount to give to a missionary, that was his sole income for the month down there. And he was muy contento, right? He was giving the long fine. Matter of different economies and the way things are, and it wasn't much to us at all. But it made a big difference to him. You see, the same thing was probably true back in this time. Corinth probably could have taken complete care of the, the shortfall in Jerusalem and the poor there with the amount of, they had in extra. And so Paul's like, you know, if you would excel in your generosity, just like you excel in all of these other things, <laughs> wow, you guys would, would totally be a blessing to the ones that are really poor. And the others that are poor to the north of you, who are kind of poor, you know, they wouldn't, you know, be burdened so much with having to make up so much because you guys can really afford it, and they really can't, and they want to. So see? So, anyway. Got a little competition going there, huh? So, uh, anyway, uh, uh, if a person has God trust issues, and this, this is still the same subject he's doing, and it's the last paragraph. If a person has God trust issues, then they think that they have to be in control of their finances. Right? I gotta be in control. I gotta know how much money I have so I know that I can pay that bill and I know pay that I can pay that bill because I don't trust God enough. Got God, God trust issues, right? Um, they have to be able to see where ends will be met. They have to be have to be able to see that they can do this themselves. They have to know. Uh, they will pray and beg God to help them, but they see their money and bills as theirs, not his. 
God's perspective again, right? A person who totally trusts God to provide no matter what and understands that the money is his and their bills, even though the bills are theirs, they're his too because he's promised to meet your needs, right? They, they come to understand that their, their bills, their money, even their credit rating are in the hands of God, in his hands, and that that person has the right mindset to also experience the grace of giving and this thing that Paul is encouraging them to excel in. So a wealthy person has a harder time coming to that place, but if and when they do, God can do great things with their generosity. So just remember that. Um, verses 8 and 9. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnest of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now he's substituting poverty in place of suffering. And you know, his poverty was, he was beaten, he was put to death. Anyway, he was sure to mention that this wasn't a command. First of all, I'm not commanding you from the apostle or from God. Uh, such a thing must come from a free will in order for the heart to be right in it. Because the heart's not right if it's being commanded. Uh, Paul wanted to move them to generosity by arousing a little bit of jealousy in them. That others were very generous and didn't have nearly as many resources as they did. But if they really wanted someone to compare themselves to, they only need to look at the Lord and His example. You know, because he was rich. I mean, the prince of heaven, right? Became a, a mere human being, one of his creation, to a poor young Jewish couple that couldn't even make ends meet. They were just camping along the way, riding on a donkey, you know. Uh, but learned the trade of carpentry, and the Lord blessed them. So uh, look to Jesus as your example. Jesus was owner of not just many lands, but an entire universe. All of creation belongs to him. Yet he made himself to be born of a poor Jewish child in a time period before air conditioning, in fact before heating other than a campfire or a lamp of some kind and um, running water, refrigeration, microwaves, smartphones, all of those things, you know, he didn't have any of that. So that's the time period he even chose to come in. So, all right, verses uh, 10 through 12 now. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. So finish what you started. Last year you guys were eager to get right on this. It was a new idea. Yeah, let's give. Let's be a part of that. This year is like, where are they? This hasn't come about yet. And the Macedonians have already given. Right? Uh, put your money where your mouth is, Corinthians. That's what he, kind of what he's saying here. It's like when you go to an inspirational event and you say, I'm definitely going to go again next time. Right? camp or, you know, a retreat or something. Very inspirational and you were there and you're glad and I'm going next time. By the time the next year rolls around you forgot all about it. Eh, you didn't put aside any money. You didn't have the money for the 120 bucks it is for the retreat or anything like that. Oh, I just can't go and everything. But boy last year when you got back it was like I'm going all the time from now on. Right? So anyway that's kind of the idea that they seem to be displaying here. Um, they just don't feel it anymore. Uh, I don't 
feel like it, like I did last year when I came back. So Paul's confronting that problem. Follow through with what you said you'd do, he says. God evaluates the acceptability of our gifts on a couple of factors. And Paul is bringing them out here. When our giving is acceptable, it is exchanged for treasure in heaven. Now remember, remember that. When he says the gift is acceptable, well, I mean, you could give and they'll take it and it'll go. But is it acceptable to God in exchange for heavenly currency? You know what I'm saying? Is a reward for that gift. The person that has millions and they're in an event and it might even make them look good to do so could say, I'm going to write this check for $1,000. Look at there. I gave to this event and everybody's, wow, very generous person. Thousand. Everybody else is putting 10 bucks in or five, you know, and this guy writes a check out for $1,000 and he really looks generous, right? Well, you know, maybe his motivation for that was to look good in front of everybody. Maybe he was, as they say, tooting his own horn, you know, in, in this. You know, patting himself on the back so bad he threw his shoulder out of socket. Right? You know, maybe that was the thing. And if so, is there a reward in heaven for that? Is there a currency exchange? Uh, that, that, that took place? I don't think so. The gift was still taken. Sure, they take the gift. It was still made. That doesn't mean it was acceptable. So when Paul says it, it will be acceptable, he's not talking about whether or not it's going to make it to who you give it to. He's talking about whether it's acceptable to God as something that you're going to be blessed for doing. You see, uh, if, if the reason was, you know what, I'm going to slip this check in or I'm not even going to tell them whatever. It's not for me to get recognition, but I can afford this. These people are giving and I feel like the Lord's saying, I need to give generously. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to slip it in there and everything. And that's it. That's all I want to hear about it now. It's done. I was obeying the Lord, right? Being generous because I was moved by the Spirit to do so. So I did. Put it in there. And, uh, have you ever done that? You ever been in an experience like that? The Holy Spirit just moved you and you just gave and, and did? I have. And, 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 and it wasn't for recognition. Didn't even want people to know. It was just, I'll put that in there. I'm going to just give and give to this need because I can. I know I can do this. The Lord has blessed me. I can do that. I'm going to give there. And it, no. What I'm telling you is that that was rewarded in heaven. Even, if, even though it was not something that really cost me a lot either. I mean, it wasn't out of a, of a deficit. It wasn't like I wasn't going to be able to get by because I gave that. I still was able to get by. But it was because I was giving from the right motive and the right nature. So the gift is acceptable to God as far as that exchange for heavenly treasures. Your treasures on earth, convert them into heavenly currency every chance you get. You know, that's the only way you can build up your bank account in heaven. You can exchange the, the currency you have here for that. So, anyway, um, God evaluates that acceptability by those these couple of things. First, it's willingness. Is the heart right? If the heart isn't in it, the gift is not acceptable. If I'm giving this because I feel like I kind of have to, the person next to me, you know, we live on the same street, drive the same kind of car, and they just gave something like that. Well, I better too, because i got to keep up with the Joneses, right? I've got to, my giving has to look as good as them, otherwise I don't look as good as them. I have to make sure everybody knows I gave just as much as Jones did, right? Is that an acceptable gift? No. It wasn't out of a real willingness. But the willingness that was there to Jones, he just wanted to, you know... It's, that's acceptable to the Lord. I don't know. I, I'm just picking on the name Jones here uh, in case. It could be whatever name. Um, it, when you give reluctantly or under duress, the gift isn't acceptable for transfer to heavenly treasure. That's what Paul's trying to tell you. Any gift in any amount that is of a willing and eager heart is acceptable. Even any gift in any amount, if it's come from a willing and eager heart, it's acceptable. 
It might even be more acceptable if it really costs you something. You see? But it is acceptable. So the other factor is the amount. How much are you giving? And I'm not talking about, you know, what the dollar sign is. It's how much of what you have are you giving? How much does it cost you, right? If you have $1,000 and you give $500 of it and you don't know how you're going to get by, uh, but you did because you felt like the Lord was leading you to and you did in it and it cost you something and not only was it acceptable, it's also going to be greatly rewarded because it came out of a need because you needed that. But you're going to trust that the Lord will make up the need. I won't be able to do the things I wanted to do because I spent that on that, but that's all right. I'm going to give to it anyway because I know the Lord will make up for that need. Now it just went to a second level. That's level two generosity right there. It's a, the level that goes into the fact that you don't, you don't know that you're going to get by now. You had $700 worth of bills and you just gave $500 away and you only had 1000 to start with. Now you've got 500 and still have $700 worth of bills. Where's it coming from, right? I'm just picking numbers off the, out of the hat here. I don't know that they even matter to you, but put another zero on it if it helps or take a zero off if it makes more sense to you. I don't know, but whatever works. So, God never wants you to rob one, one to give to another. That's the thing. You know, I, I owe this guy this money. I've got to give him that money or, you know, and so I don't give him his money. I rob from that. That's not what he's wanting. That belongs to somebody else. It's not even yours. So, don't rob from Peter to pay Paul, right? But when it comes down to, okay, I paid Peter and I paid Paul, and how much is left for me? That's not going to be enough to get by on. Well, good. Now you have to depend on the Lord to help you get by the rest of the way. Right? So when it comes to obligations and bills, pay your bills. You know, it always used to irk me when, when, when we'd have to decide, when some people have to decide whether or not they're going to pay this bill or they're going to pay that bill. No, you have an obligation. You have an obligation to pay that bill, so that's not even uh, up for discussion. It's owed, it's owed, right? Anyway, it's beyond that it's where we're talking. So, this principle is that a small gift from one who doesn't have much may transfer in heaven to as much as a large gift from one who has tons. Or it could even be more heavenly currency. You see? So, in God's economy, things work a little differently than in the world's economy. And I think we all get it. Am I kicking this dead horse long enough here? You get what we're talking about. All right. So, the poor widow in Luke 21 gave two cents. She gave more than the rich men around her who gave more money, but it was because it was all she had. And that was the difference. The acceptable amount is according to what you have, Paul said. It's according to what you have. It doesn't matter what the number sign, the numbers in it are. That's not what matters. Um, so, verses 13 to 15. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality, as it is written, He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. So Paul was not collecting gifts to send to Jerusalem so that the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem there could live in luxury at the expense of the others living in poverty. That's not what he's doing. Uh, he, he wasn't meaning for those with little to give to those who already had it better than them. He also wasn't talking about a form of socialism or communism, right? The it, redistribution of, of wealth. This was a free will gift to ease the poverty of those who were living under religious persecution and who refused help from their Jewish neighbors. So the equality was not with every person, but with fellow believers, and not necessarily exact equality either, just one's extra given to another's need. 
that's, that's what we're talking about. So, verses 16 and 17. So, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm on his own initiative. Titus had become a very important man of God in the mission field at this time. Uh, he made a lot of runs between the apostles and between the different churches, and he was even assigned the duty of appointing elders in the towns on the island of Crete. So he, Titus had become someone that was at near the apostle level himself. Um, so Paul was acknowledging Titus' calling as a minister and an overseer over ministries. So Christian leaders sometimes have a great privilege of seeing some that have that they have helped guide into the ministry, catch the vision from the Holy Spirit themselves, and take off with it. And that's pretty cool when you see that, when you help to guide somebody else in the ministry, and then you see them catching it from the Holy Spirit themselves and taking off with it. And that's, that's a great privilege. And Paul is being blessed. There's a blessing that you couldn't buy. See, Paul is seeing that, and that's a blessing that wasn't a matter of being paid back a hundredfold uh, of money. You know what I'm saying? This is a different kind of blessing, and that's the kind of blessings that the Lord provides us with. So, verses 18 and 19. And we are sending along with him, Titus, the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more... He was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. So good things are said about this other mysterious brother, but he's not named. <laughs> that's, that's strange here. There's this other mysterious brother that, that was sent with them. He just His name's not given. We really can't know for sure who it is, but some speculate it might have been Luke. Others have said maybe it was Timothy or Silas or Barnabas, but we don't know for sure. We can't, and it doesn't really matter. For some reason, the Holy Spirit chose to not mention who this special brother was for us. Otherwise, people might start name churches after him, you know, right? So it doesn't really matter. It was somebody that all the other churches are comfortable with letting him handle their gift, their money. So, verses 20 through 22. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we're sending with them our brother, who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. So now we're seeing a concept mentioned by Paul here of doing right in the eyes of the Lord and of men. He doesn't make it the main theme here, but just brings it up. Uh, in other letters, he does come as a major principle, but here, do what's right in the eyes of the Lord and of men, but the, the eyes of the Lord first. Uh, we, we can often be in a position where something we're doing is suspect in the eyes of men. We might know that we are blameless and know that we are right with God in the matter, but the appearance of evil still exists in the eyes of onlookers. Like it or not, if you're a Christian, you're representing Christ at all times. So are you showing the true face of Christ is, is the question. It may be true that God's opinion of me is the one that matters the most, but his opinion of me, if I misrepresent him to the world, is not going to be good. Uh, if I am blameless in my heart to God, good. But I must also be blameless in the eyes of people if I am to represent Jesus well. To a point, Jesus was not himself blameless in the eyes of all of the people. There are those who didn't think he was blameless and did not believe in him or believe him at all. Verse 23 and 24 now. As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. These men represent Christ and they also represent other churches. 
they will tell others how they are treated and what kind of people the Corinthian Christians are. So you need to bear that in mind. When we interact with people from other churches, how do we represent this church? Right? Go to a, a great big a retreat or some big thing that the churches are putting on together and we interact with the other churches that are around them, do we represent this church well? And I have seen people not do such a good of that job of that by thinking themselves to be so superior of the ones from certain other churches. And that doesn't set well. You know, so we're going to represent our church. We're going to show our loving nature towards the others of other churches as well. So this is what our calling is. So, do you complain about things in your church when talking to people from another fellowship? No, I don't want you to answer this. Because... You might have one person that's willing to say no out loud and the rest are just quiet and then everyone else is wondering, why are they quiet? You know, no, just it's a rhetorical question. Do you show a side of Christ that we would want our church reputation built on? Do they think our church follows the word of God and teaches sound doctrine? Or by watching you, do they think that church must not be into the word of God? Hmm. You have to represent well. This chapter is taught a lot about giving and reputation. The two things do actually overlap, and they were told in conjunction with each other. Uh, we should learn to look forward to giving. It should become part of our worship to God. Put your heart into it. Our giving should come first as our God is first in our lives. We don't offer him leftovers, so we give according to what we have not, not what is left after we spend everything else. Our giving is a meter that can show how we trust God. And a person who totally trusts God will give financially before they spend trusting, uh, before they spend everything, and they'd be trusting God to make ends meet. And um, that's our reputation in the community is a direct reflection on the God we serve and the church we fellowship in. And so it's a good thing to remember that. Um, that's chapter 8, and that's the lessons we learn from it. And uh, I'm sure that it speaks to you in different ways. Everyone sees it and hears it in a way that fits them personally. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, your word. I thank you for the blessings that you give and the fact that you are washing us in your word and forming us into the image of Christ. Let us represent well, let our light shine in this dark community and help us make a difference. And all these requests we make, we ask you to go before us and help us along the way in everything that we do. And it's all through Jesus Christ we pray.